I should have uh, just brain locked. I, I've seen something happen. Oh, 
You pull your Bibles out and uh, turn to, uh, boy, my little mind just went glip. Judges, chapter 8. Sometimes, sometimes. I'm sorry, for some reason I am frying this morning. I feel like I have jumped from the frying pan into the fire. I'm sweating. Everybody out there smiling. You're sweating too? Wow. Oh, it's not just me. I feel better. Um, is that fan on back? Yeah, it is. Okay. Huh? I'm going to leave that to the women to decide. I'm not getting into that one. I usually get in the midst of things and cause problems. So today, I'm staying out. Okay. We're going to, in, in Judges chapter 8, verses 28, we're going to start in. We, we really was about through with 28, but we'll, um, we're going to pick up in that and work our way down. Um, what was that? I do, I do, and I'm hogging it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, 28 says, Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more, and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. Um, uh, so Israel was blessed by coming back to God and following after him. And then after the victory, we see the degradation start again. Um, it's funny how these uh, things go. But anyway, uh, Israel was, was uh, after their victory, they began to... Uh, go away from God. There was a seed planted by Gideon. Uh, maybe I should say there was a seed by the devil planted in Gideon for the lust of, of riches and things. And then because of that seed, uh, a desire to maybe have worship easier, to make that ephod and have it there close. But whatever it was, um, we got to be careful because good things can be used for bad purposes. Um, uh, I've often said that the Bible can be used against you as well as you can use it against sin. There are people out there that are apostate that know the Word of God better than we do. And they will use it to destroy what you believe. Um, my best advice, and I'll just put in my two cents worth right here. When you run across those people, run. You can't help them anyway. If they're seeking to destroy the things of God, then treat them as the devil who's seeking to destroy and, and devour the people of God and just leave them alone. Uh, leave them to their own devices. You can pray for them. You know, and you don't really know till you actually come in contact with them. But there are times when you just can't. You just have to let them go. So anyway, uh, looking at this, uh, the principle comes forth. And, and I just want to, to, to say this when we think about uh, how he made the ephod, which was a, for the priests and stuff. You cannot violate the word of God and worship God. Uh, you just can't do it. Those two don't go hand in hand. He had no business making that ephod that was a garment for the priest and so you cannot violate the word of God and still worship God um, also you cannot violate the word of God without consequences for your actions always it's going to happen uh, so we need to be uh, as careful as we can now that that consequence may not be today it may not be tomorrow but there will be consequences uh, there was a man that uh, uh, preached in the church one time that we were in, and he made that statement. You can make your own choice, but you can't choose your consequences. I wrote that down. I've never forgot it. You can choose to smoke cigarettes if you want, but whether you eat cancer or not, it's on God. You can choose to drink if you want, but whether you become an alcoholic with liver cirrhosis, that's on God. Some people say, well, you know, I've seen people do that all their life and never get them. Sure. 
But there's a lot more to do. There are consequences. You know, I read something this morning. And I don't think I wrote it in anything. Um, let's see if I can recall the verses. I think one was in Hebrews 11, 16. I could be wrong. One was in Hebrews and one was, was um, Psalm. But the comparison was pleasure. The first one in Hebrews was there's pleasures in sin for a season. But then in Psalms it says that um, before the throne of God there's pleasures forevermore. So you choose how long you want your pleasure. Do you want them in this world to be temporal? And they are for a season because you only live for so long. Or do you want them forevermore with God for all eternity? And so the choice is not whether you will have pleasure. That's, the, that's what the devil tries to fool you into believing. You have to go with the world to have pleasure. God says, no, you just need to choose how long you want your pleasure. You know, do you want it to be for all? Huh? Sure, sure. Uh, but, but the idea is pleasure, that which, which makes you happy, and you, you choose that. But the consequences are on God, temporal or eternal. Um, I, I, I look and, and, and I think about uh, what's happening in Gideon's life, and, and I always bring it back to today and the thoughts of today. And, and I believe um, it would be fair to say that uh, people today believe that God will not judge them. I think they've uh, got into this that God is long-suffering, and, and they don't call it long-suffering. They say God is not able. There's a difference between being long-suffering and being able to judge. There's a, there's a difference between God uh, having mercy and grace and, and Him uh, willing to, to wait and try to see you or, or wait for you to come to repentance or being instantly judging on you. I appreciate that the Lord is the Lord of second chances. I appreciate that he has the ability to judge and doesn't judge. But I think we've come into a time where uh, people no longer see that as true. Um, I think also a lot of people believe that, that, that God has to take what worship we give him. It doesn't matter if it's in violation of the word of God or not. We're going to worship him the way we want and God will accept it. This is kind of like what I think uh, Gideon was doing in a way. We're going to set this up. I know the priest over there. I know we're supposed to go there, but this is going to be easier for us. Well, have you ever read the history of the children of Israel? When Rehoboam come in, they divided, and uh, Jeroboam made, well, I think it was Jehoshaphat first, but they made the, the calves and said, these are your gods. They started worshiping them, so they would not go to Israel, to the temple, the synagogue, to worship. And what did they bring on Israel? If you start looking at the judges after that, they didn't have any good judges. You know, but after a while, the degradation was seen in Judah as well. Um, God doesn't have to accept your worship. Uh, and he's not going to accept whatever you're willing to give. He lays down the standards. He lays down the principles. And it's us. Uh, uh, we have um, uh, spoken a lot on Thursdays over coffee and, 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 and different uh, conversations, this line has come up repeatedly. We reconcile ourselves to the Word. We don't reconcile the Word to ourselves. And that's so important that we understand that in our day and age. There's a lot of pressure for a lot of things uh, to bend and say, well, you know, it's okay. Well, this is the standard. This is the final word in our lives. This is what we judge our actions by. But let me ask you this. If we don't have the word of God as a standard and, and to, as a ruler, if you would, to measure our lives by, what is the measure by which we measure? There you go, the book of Judges. Well, and then the Bible says, then the Bible says comparing yourselves among yourselves as the matter of some is, is not wise. Uh, the, this, is, this is the standard. This is the measuring rule. And so when we reconcile it to our lives, we change the standard and we make it what we want it. We lose the power of God because this is where it's at, in obedience to his word. And we have to be careful with that. Does it ever happen in our lives? 
Um, it's like Lot when he was leaving out the city. Can I go to Zior? It's just a little city. It's just a little thing. And we do that. Oh, this is not a big thing. It's just a little thing. I don't care what the size is. If it's standing in between you and God, it's pretty big. If God has put his finger on it and said, give that to me, it's pretty big. Because it's stopping you from going in the, in the direction and in the way God wants you to go. Um, so anyway, he doesn't have to and he, and he doesn't. He has given us the standard and we need to get to it. Um, I wrote a statement down here. I'm trying to figure out how I figured it in all this. I don't know. So we'll go on. We'll leave it there. It's a good statement, but I don't remember how it tied in, okay? Anyway, sometimes you just have those bad mornings. Um, I, you know, as we look at everything that Gideon has gone through, we look at this battle and all, and you would think that after the, the feet of the Midianites and, and all that God has done in their life, you would think that the people would wholeheartedly follow after God. I mean, I could see where the, there should be so much zeal and, and, and uh, excitement to, to, to just to, to kneel at the, the, the altar of God and pray. And uh, I could see that. Can you not see that? You know, put yourself, we're, we, we don't, they're not living in our day. You know, when, they didn't have combines. You know what combines did? They took a month of sicking and put it in about a couple days. I think about a day, really. I remember we went to Ukraine the first time. We went through, and we were going along, and there were huge fields of wheat. And there were people out there cutting these huge fields of wheat. And if you looked over in the distance, there was a combine that hadn't worked in 20 years. They had had the technology before, but they weren't able to keep it up. And now they were back to the old way. And I tell you what, you want to get healthier, kill yourself quick. That's the way to do it. Those people were in that boiling sun and they were going to town. I was thinking, man, oh man. But uh, you, you understand that, that they should have been uh, excited and sold out. And, and they probably were, but was it, a total, uh, was it a total defeat of Midian? I think we could call it a complete. Because they were gone. They're quiet 40 years. Okay, so they were done. They weren't a threat no more. I, in my mind, when you read in the verse, it says this in 28. It says, uh, uh, Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. There was no more pride. They had humbled Midian. Gideon had done what God had called him to do. He had humbled Midian. They had left. They lifted up their heads no more. They were thoroughly destroyed as their ability and their power to wage war with Israel. You know, if I was in their shoes, in the Midian shoes, my kings were dead, the princes were dead, I would probably be afraid of the, the retribution that Israel would bring to me now. It didn't happen. We don't see that happening. There was quiet for 40 years. Um, they were keeping a low profile because of their weakness and fear of my white, what might would happen. Um, let me give you a little thought in here. Um, we talked about Midian being humbled. Um, and I just, I guess this will be obvious to you, but I'm going to go through it for a second. I, I, I found it interesting to note that if you really looked at what was happening, the Israelites had departed from God. They be live, began living a wicked life. The Midianites were used by God to judge Israel. Basically, the idea was, if you think about it, Israel was humbled by the Midianites, impoverished, destroyed. I mean, they, they were just judging them harshly, so they were hum humbled. The Midianites then were lifted up, prideful. Israelites were humbled. They began to seek back to God like they should. God began to raise them up. They were used to humble the Midianites. Is that not the story of our life? Is that not the story of the book of Judges? We lift ourselves up, we're humbled. We lift ourselves up, we're humbled. We lift our... Boy, I'm so glad the mountaintops are narrow. 
you know, because we spend so much time away from God if there's any water. Don't go to the plateaus. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I asked myself this question when I left this verse. Am I in this cycle? Are we, is anyone, you need to ask yourself, am I in this cycle? Am I in, uh, continually in this cycle? Uh, we need to be drawing closer and closer to God. Because when we get into a position that we are no longer humble, I don't care how well you're doing, but when you're no longer humble, you're on the edge of the, the precipice. You're on the edge of the fall. Because God has to bring you back. He's not going to let you as a child of God to continue to wander in the wilderness. He's not going to do it. Um, uh, let's go on to 29. Boy, I got some other things I want to get into, but I'm not going to do it. My mind is um, uh, thinking all sorts of stuff. Uh, I have some questions on this verse. I don't have a whole lot here, but I've got some questions on it. It says, And Jerubbabel, the son of Joash, went and, and, and dwelt in his own house. Now, my first question is, what, what's the first thing you see in this verse that ought to raise a, a, your eyebrows? There's something that should, at least it does to me. It stands out immediately to me, and I'm like, why did you do it, Lord? And I don't have an answer for it, by the way. Um, what do you see? Anybody? Who is Jerubal? Huh? Why did they put it, this Jerubal in there and not Gideon? The verse before says Gideon, the verse after says Gideon. Why did they put Jerubal, the son of Joash, here? Why did he not use Gideon? I don't understand that. I was hoping maybe somebody could enlighten me, give me an idea I could think of, because I spent 30 minutes this morning trying to figure that out. Why did they use this? Why did they jump from one to the other? Gideon means hewer, okay? But Jerubal means um, something about Baal. I, I, I forget now. It's a, it's a preface on, on Baal. It, it gives you something. I don't remember. I'm sorry. I thought I had that locked in. So whatever reason they did this, I, I, I'm confident the Spirit of God has influenced the writer to do it. And I'm confident there's a lesson here, but I really couldn't grip it. I couldn't figure out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it. Thank you. But you know, the reason he got this is because he destroyed the grove, the idol grove of Baal. So Baal contend. Um, he um, contends with Baal. Or, but, but why the difference? Why do they use Gideon all through this and then they use that name which his father give him here? Jerubal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house and then immediately they go back to using Gideon. I wish I could tell you I don't, and, and if you come up with a good idea, please, I'd love to hear it because I, I, I really would like to know why God did that or, or have a good idea or, or have something to think on. Um, so anyway, uh, I, what I do know is this. I know that God's calling on Gideon to lead Israel against the Midianites was completed. Um, uh, he had followed God's command. I know that now Israel was free to serve God and live without the Midianites' oppression. Um, when I read this verse, Jerubal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house, I get a sense of finality here. I get a sense that this is finished. Now we're transitioning into something. That's how my sense is. Um, the war is ended. He's no longer leading these men. Now he's going to his own house. Um, uh, I think, it, and, and when I mentioned this in the last verse, do you think that uh, Midian was completely destroyed? I think the, the calling was complete. That's what I think. Um, now, with that said, I'm going to run a rabbit trail for a second because I was thinking about completing things. Um, I do a lot of little projects around, and um, I've got probably uh, four, five things I'm working on. And it seems like when I get to a certain place, I need another tool. 
My wife knows I've been talking about one tool for over a year, and I've, I, I don't want to buy it new because it's a lot of money. So I've been kind of waiting and looking in Goodwill's and thrift stores, and you know, I've been looking online. I'm just trying to find this thing at a at a deal. You know, I can uh, I can refurbish it myself. I can make it work and do what I want. And then I figured out this is not going to happen, so I started making me one from scratch. And I'm, I'm pretty well doing done. I just got a little bit of more sharpening on the blade, which will probably take at my pace another week. But anyway. When I have all these things hanging, I'm not satisfied. Does anybody have jobs they do and when they're hanging they're not satisfied? How about when you complete them? There's a satisfaction. And what happens when you get satisfied? Well, you get pleased with yourself. You are encouraged. You're willing to, to go, okay, I've got this done. I like to have a list. Okay, this is the next one on my list. But I found out I can prioritize them and put them in these priorities. And, and well, I don't have what it takes to do this. So I, well, next time I go to the store, and then I'm like, my goodness. So it's always something. But when I complete one, it does feel, feel good. Um, but it seems like I always start two more. Anyway. <clears throat> there is a satisfaction that comes from working with your hands. There is a satisfaction from doing things. Uh, I can imagine that when Gideon was in this war, he was following God, God was blessing. There was a satisfaction in that. I can imagine that as they would go from one victory to another victory, as God was leading them, there was a satisfaction in that. But I can always also imagine that when he was done with the battles and he was able to put all those swords and, and, and spears and all aside and the men were able to go home, there was a great satisfaction We've completed the task. We're done. We can go home. Now the mindset at that point is what? Relief. Relaxation. We're done. We're no longer battling. But is that true? Exactly. That's where I'm going at it. Satisfaction is always good. But don't let it lull you to sleep. Don't let it take your mind off that even though those Midianites were destroyed, Miss Minor was right. It was not complete. Because they will rise up again. Your enemies, they may scurry for a while. Those victories that you have, you may be able to put them at bay. But sooner or later, if you get satisfied, especially in your walk with God, It'll raise its ugly head again, and it'll be stronger than it was before. It'll know more about how to defeat you. The devil's no, no fool, if you would. So we have to be careful. Um, <clears throat> we have to be careful that we, we don't let a time of great enjoyment be one of also of great danger. Have you ever thought about that? I, I use a statement sometimes, uh, and I say... Your greatest asset is also be your greatest weakness. Your greatest joy could be your greatest heartbreak. Your greatest strength, something you're really good at, could be what causes you to fall the furthest. I've, I've spoken before about uh, a man I knew that was, he was young, tremendous Bible teacher, tremendous Bible preacher. I mean, everybody just loved to hear him do that. And today he's no longer in the ministry. He's no longer married. He has totally destroyed his life. But he was great. Dr. Comfort, which was the president of the college um, that I went to, Ambassador Baptist College, uh, we were talking one day, and, and not that I'm anything great, just happened to be that we were talking, and, and uh, it come up about abilities and, and those making the good grades, and he made this statement. At that point, and, and I don't know if it's true today, but at that point, he said there are no uh, 4.0 average students that graduated from here in the ministry today. Those with the greatest abilities, the greatest potential, were not in the ministry. 
See, you never pick somebody on potential. Why? They be, that's right. They begin to rely on yourself. So if you don't pick them on potential, what do you pick them on? What did you say? Humility. All that's tied in, but there's one better word for it. Character. You choose their heart. It includes character. It includes humility, but you choose the heart. You choose a person whose heart is for God. The rest doesn't matter. The rest doesn't matter. You, you know, they ne- may not ever be the best, but if they got a heart for God, God will bless. And that's what you want. You want the heart. Uh, never choose on talent. Never choose on ability. Always choose for their heart. Um, so anyway, uh, I just want to, I'm going to put this in there. I think I can because I'm big and heavy. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and so I can get away with things like that. And plus I'm getting older and that helps. I can claim senility. Um, I remember watching uh, a little thing years ago on TV talking about dieters. And these ladies, and it was just a ladies group, so please forgive me, um, but these ladies, and it would be true of anybody, they would go out and they would walk a mile or, or they would do 30 minutes of exercise in the gym. And then after that, which they did twice a week, they would go and reward themselves with a piece of pie. When you figured it out, they had burned 150 calories in the time they were in the gym, but they added 600 on the pie. You understand what I'm saying? Be careful. Well, you know, I deserve this. Well, yeah, I deserved and deserved and deserved, and now look what I deserve, okay? You know, uh, there is never a time to let your guard down. You've got to be conscious of what's going on. Um, and I, I still go back to 1 Peter 5, 8. Um, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is... Uh, uh, Yeah, but there's two words in there. Is walking about, seeking whom he made his hour. I knew there was two, walking about. So anyway, um, now let's stop with that verse for a minute. I got the time, my dime. When you read that verse, that he is walking about, seeking whom he may devour. What does that tell you? Let me take what you just said and change it a little bit. He's occupied in hunting. You ever seen a cat hunt? He's walking about. He's looking. He's occupying his time looking to see what he might get. Those cats, when they walk across that yard, they kind of like... But if a bird flops, they're on I mean, they're not, they're not ignorant of what's happening. Seems like we're more of the sheep Isn't that what God calls us? We're more ignorant to what's going around, but the devil's not. He's more of the lying. He's the hunter. He is occupying his time in the hunt. And we need to be careful that we don't allow him to destroy us and what we're trying to accomplish. Getting back to Gideon for a moment, I'm just going to say this. He went and he dwelt in his own house. And I just wanted to close this verse with this. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the spoils of war. There's nothing wrong with the blessings God has given you for your labors or by your labors, no matter how great or how little God has blessed you, enjoying those blessings is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And praise the Lord for them. Praise the Lord. He's allowed you the blessings in life. Um, But just be careful of the pitfalls that can come from blessings. You know, there are things that even though they're a blessing, if we let them, will trip us up, will cause us to to go away. So don't, don't be foolish. Be wise. Um, don't allow yourself to be lulled to sleep or into a false sense of safety or security. Um, I was just thinking um, back in the Depression, and I've heard stories, and I wasn't alive then, praise the Lord, but um, does it show? Um, 
But there were millionaires made, and people went from millionaires to be penniless. I mean, people that had nothing come out of the Depression with millions. But people that went in with millions come out with nothing. You know, the idea I was getting to is um, uh, we sometimes uh, allow ourselves that false sense. Uh, you know, I've got all this. I'm not worried about what's happening around us. Always be careful of what's going on. Um, but not only in the world around you, but in your life. Where's your heart at? Is your heart for God or is your heart for the things of the world? Are you, are you getting so wrapped up um, that you can't see the trees for the forest? And we've heard that before. We, we get so focused that we miss what God's trying to show us. Um, as I close this verse, I, I look through um, the use of house, his own house. And I found it very interesting that that most of the times, over 1,800 times in Scripture, it's used as house or household. But there were a few times that same word was used for temple or prison. And I said, that's a big disparity in use. Um, be careful that the blessings of God don't become a prison to you. <laughs> don't Be careful that the blessings of God don't become your temple. There's only one God. And we need to be sure our focus is on him. So anyway, all right, in verse 30, I think I've got a few minutes left. On verse 30, it says, And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, and he had, for he had many wives. Uh, first thing I'll say is he's a brave man. I'm not, going to claim he's, I'm not going to claim he was intelligent. Um, he, was very, he was fruitful in his marriages. He had many sons, 70 sons. Can you imagine? I'm sure every kid he had wasn't a son. So how many kids did he have? I don't know. But that is a lot of children. So how many wives is that? Seven? Ten kids each? Fourteen? Twenty? I don't know. But the... I have a saying about that. No offense, ladies, but two is too many. I think it is a... He, it was a blessing that God had given him in the 70 sons. Uh, I don't know in that day and age how this, the deal was exactly with the wives. Um, I don't think that's God's will for that. Um, but I, my personal thought here, and, and I'm going to say it that way, my personal thoughts, my opinion is Gideon had allowed himself to get carried away. And not just a little bit. He really got carried away. Well, we know he at least had one. Yeah, um, and you look at this, and you have to ask yourself, was it his riches that enabled him, the blessing that he got? Uh, and and I'm, we, didn't, we, we mentioned that he really shouldn't have asked for that, more than likely, but he asked for it. Is it those riches? They had already led him in a spiritual downfall. Now we're seeing he actually, it's, it's a little bit more than spiritual. It, it goes into his life with his, his family and was he dynasty building? Did he want to leave a legacy behind? Um, a lot of pastors like to try to leave a dynasty. They want their, their kid to come in after them, their son take over and preach. Not necessarily anything wrong with that. Um, if that's not their intention to build a dynasty, I don't think there's anything wrong. If that, their son is the best one uh, for the job, praise the Lord. You know, you know what you're getting. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but if the thought is, you know, uh, I want this to be what I leave behind for my son, then that's a little different. Legacy building. Um, is he wanting to, to leave? It's like, you know, I'm going to leave a statue of myself so when everybody goes by, they remember me. Uh, that's not what we're after. That's getting into our own self-worship. What we want to leave behind is something for people to remember us. But let me, just, let me just ask you this question. When you leave this world, what do you want to be remembered for? When I tell you and say this, Gideon, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Gideon. 
What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Anybody? Sir? Victory over the Midianites. See, I, I don't. First thing I think about Midian is the fle- uh, Gideon is the fleeces. That's the first thing. And what do you think? Same thing? Well, I think of all that, but I also think of the sadness in his decline. You know, I would not have even caught the sadness of his decline, even though I've read this many times. Because of what he did here, you keep reading and it, it just ends in tragedy. But, but even in that, the thing that always caught me was the fleeces. He prayed twice. You know, I got one fleece full of water and then I prayed and, and the other one's not. Uh, and I've always hung up on that. Not, I'm not saying that's a negative or a positive. I'm saying that's where my mind hung. But what would he have wanted us to remember him for? The battle over the Midianites. But do we? And so I think of that and I look at my life and I say, what do I want to be remembered for? What do you want to be remembered for? You know, I would, I would think that we'd want to remember for that he was a child of God. He was a faithful servant, you know. Uh, I've often said this, that when I stand before God one day, I want him to stamp me and say, thou good and faithful servant, because it'll be on me for all eternity. I don't want to be known for stingy. I don't want to be known for anything ungodly. Um, as a preacher, as a, a missionary... Uh, pastoring this church at this point, to be honest with you, I wouldn't want somebody to write on my tombstone, he loved to work wood. I wouldn't want that. You know? And I'm not saying anything is wrong with working wood, but if I have to be remembered for something, I would want to be remembered for a heart of God. But how that, how people remember me is all according to the choices I make today and how I live my life. And each one of us need to determine that. Here's the fact. People see your life. And when they see your life, and they, they, they see your name or, or hear your name in a conversation, they think about you. And there's some things that come to mind. I don't know what they are. I have no idea. But I hope that we're trying to leave the right impression. I would want everybody to think I was a man of God, you know. Um, And you know the big issue with that is you live your whole life for God and you mess up right before you die Mm -hmm. and they remember the mess up. Mm -hmm. On my tombstone it'll say, here lies he who messed up, you know. (laughs) And I'm thinking, that's not what I wanted you to remember. It's definitely not what I want you to put on there, you know. Um, So it's, it's something that we need to think about and pray about and and, and trust God to lead us in the right direction. And uh, hopefully, years from now, when, when you have relatives that speak of you, they'll say, well, you know what? They were godly people and, and have a tremendous testimony. Maybe you did, those kids, 100 years from now, will ask questions, you know, about what were they doing there? What, you know? Remember Sheffy? How long ago was that? All right, we are dismissed.